Hey, welcome everyone to the Nutmeg Tavern. This is a special candlelit edition. Hope you enjoy this. We're going to have fun. I am your host, John Townsend, and um, we're going to be talking about uh, historical things today, 18th century lighting and all that kind of fun stuff. I am joined not behind the bar today. Uh, Ryan is still out. He will be back next week. But uh, Aaron is on the console. Hey, everyone. There he is. I'm not going to cut to me because uh, you can't see me. You, you wouldn't be able to see him. It's so dark over there. So uh, you just got to put up with me today. It has been, again, an amazing week. And uh, just finished up an exciting cooking episode. We are just... Ooh, that was going to be fun. I spent a, a good amount of time prepping on this one, and uh, it's something to really enjoy. And uh, if you're a Patreon supporter, it's not posted yet, but I will post it probably right after the live stream or later on this evening, a special behind the scenes about uh, today's episode. So make sure to uh, check that out if you're a Patreon supporter. Uh, let's get right to the topic. Lighting in the 18th century. You know, today we walk in the room, flip on the light switch. We don't think a thing about it. I mean, nothing, right? So our power goes out and then it's like the house is dead. I mean, the water doesn't work, uh, the heating's gone and no light. You immediately see that our homes are designed to have artificial lighting in them. Uh, or else it's just, you can't, I mean, you can't function at all. You can't find anything even during the daytime. So uh, lighting in the 18th century was really important. Um, it's something that they had to think about and it changed the way they worked. That changed their work day. Um, they just, you know, maybe they didn't um, do a lot after dark. Certainly, it depends on the, the economic level of the person. So we're going to look at some paintings. We're going to look at, at um, lighting devices. I'm going to kind of walk you through all these different ones. And then we're going to look at period ones that we sell here at Townsend's so we can kind of see some of these examples in real life, at least as well as you can see them in this light. <laughs> so let's bring up the first slide. Um, notice here. This is a well-to-do um, family. Uh, they've got food on the table there. They're playing cards or some other game. It look like cards, although they're kind of long and skinny. Whole family's there with a guest. And how is it lit? One candle. <laughs> That's one single. Uh, looks, it doesn't even look like a fancy uh, candle holder in comparison to the rest of the house. It actually looks like a tin candle holder that has a sort of a, a movable um, stick. So as it goes down, you can move it up a little bit. Go ahead to the next one. Another just straight up candlestick. Love the painting here. And this is a brass or a can or a um, possibly pewter candlestick, probably a brass candlestick uh, cast in sand. Very, very uh, popular style in our 18th century time period. He's got a big candle. It's lighting him well. Luckily, uh, there are a whole host of artists in the 18th century who were loved playing with light. And so we're going to see some of these ones where the lighting and candle lighting kind of is, is the light of the picture and it makes it a very special um, illustration. So this is a neat one. Go ahead. This one is a painting. This is just a piece of a very large uh, or a very large image. Um, this is uh, 1813, I believe. It's called The Village Politicians. And we have a... Whoop, there, you went back. Oh, right sorry. There. I'm Remember. Trying, I'm making a... I'm trying to make a thumbnail. Ah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So there's a tin candle lantern, a punched tin candle lantern up there on the wall. And there is a candlestick right there on the shelf. On the wall, this is right over the fireplace. Uh, so that's where we're at there. Ooh, here we go. Um, can't, this is, this uh, image is from Diderot's Encyclopedia, and it's showing a dark lantern. And this is supposed to be happening at night. 
and you're like blinding your foe with with the candle lantern. Can you imagine? Oh, I can't see anything. The candle lantern is <laughs> it's, it's just blowing my eyes out. Uh, anyway, the um, the I don't know. Probably the night watch here is the person with the lantern. There are a lot of sort of um, night watch. Uh, people in paintings of this time period, and they almost all have a lantern just like that, um, a dark lantern. Hey, real quick, yeah. um, I don't have any music playing right now for this. Let me know in the chat if it's like you guys want a little music or not. I, we're just kind of experimenting a little bit. Today. As always, experimenting. Yeah. Uh, this lantern is a fancy punch tin lantern, and it's actually on a cord, so you can lower it probably. I believe that's what that cord is going on there. Uh, this must not be at night because there's no light really coming from that lantern. Ah, so here is a, a ruckus uh, out in the street with the different people. Uh, the the, uh, the artistry is great here. We've got these different gentlemen they're all wearing like watch cloaks and you can ha see how heavy and duffly the material is how it's held together check out the belt on these guys on the um on the right hand side i mean you can see just the thickness of the belt and how it was put together this it's just incredibly great detail here on the clothing the lantern let's check out this big he's got a big candle lantern there it's a tin one that's round. It has glass or let's say transparent panes. And you can see the holes up underneath. That's where those candles have to breathe. And so air has to come up from underneath. Uh, the other gentleman there behind the, I don't think that's actually a woman, uh, but behind the, the character with the, with the uh, shillelagh <laughs> she's about to whack somebody with, um, he's got another one of these lanterns, a little bit different design, but very, very similar. Now go to the next slide, and this is part of that same image. This is somebody who's already been smacked in the head with that stick, and his lantern has fallen on the ground. And we can see the holes underneath, and notice the uh, the transparent panes there and how there's up a dark spot on that and you might say oh what's happened there is it's fallen down the candle's still burning and it's caused soot to get on the glass but as we'll i'll show you later i don't think that's glass at all and we'll talk about that as we go go ahead next one another almost very very similar uh, round tin lantern with uh, glass panes and uh, it's got a door on the front, so we can see a lot of the um, the detail on these. These are very these are very um, um, demanding pieces to make. Almost nobody makes a reproduction of these lanterns today. In fact, none that I know of, especially with the the quality that we see in all of these images. Go ahead. Yet another one. He's got the door open on this one. This is a night watchman. He's looking at his pocket watch, um, and he's getting you know very very close to it so he can read it. Um, we also see in the background there are uh, there's sort of like street lighting going on. I'm not sure, but I think these back in the background are probably oil lamps that are in there. They've got huge wicks. You can imagine that they are creating a lot of soot. They need to be cleaned all the time. It's a, it's a very difficult. Um, Thing to keep going for any any great period of time. Go ahead. Here, this is an image from Dieter Rose Encyclopedia. This is one of the candle making operations, and there. I mean, we see this. I mean, we have everybody's seen sort of the candle molds that we see today. We think about dipping, but this is a, actually a pouring technique. So it's sort of like dipping, but instead you bring the wax up and you pour it over the top of these candles, this, the person there in front of the window, they are rolling them out flat, smashing the little bumps down because you always get all these little bumpies on it when you, when you do a dipping process or a pouring process like this. But he's making a lot of candles. Even the person there in the, uh, on the other side, on the right-hand side, I believe they're probably pulling wick through a bath of hot wax just to get wax on the wick ahead of time. And wick is, wick is something special. We'll again talk 
or at least hopefully I'll remember to talk about that uh, in a little bit. Another Diderot's Encyclopedia, and this one is kind of important, and it's definitely different than most of the other images you see of workshops. In fact, if we go back a slide, go back a slide just for a second. Notice in this slide, the only lighting that's going on in here is from the windows. We can even see the shadow from the light coming directly in the windows. There's, this workshop isn't made to be used at night unless there's lighting that we can't see. So go ahead. No, right here. Uh, so this is a, a tinsmith or somebody who's doing, working in uh, items like that, possibly a brazier, whoever. They're making items out of sheet metal. He's got big funnels there. Um, obviously, this is a, a shop you can see. It's made to be lit by the outside, but he's also showing off his wares. And if you were doing a lot of work at night and you wanted to light up this workshop a lot and you didn't want to use candles, which were expensive, you want to use an oil lamp with a lot of wicks. So go to the next slide. There's a close-up of the lighting device on the ceiling. And it's sort of like a chandelier, but it's not a chandelier for candles. That's a chandelier that uh, all those little triangles are actually little spouts that bring up wicks to burn oil. So you pour oil in that thing and you'd have like 20 different flames coming from that. That sounds dangerous, doesn't it? You don't want to hit your head on that and flying hot oil goes nah. everywhere and flames. <laughs> It'd be great. Go ahead. This is a, an image that we have looked at several times in the past. One of those beautiful, about 1770 images of a kitchen or a, a larder, a kitchen space where they're doing prep work. And yes, we have a lighting device. Go ahead to the next slide. Right there it is up there at the very top. The bird cage is open. The bird is out. We know about that, don't we? And there is the candle lantern. Again, almost seemingly pulled right out of one of these previous uh, paintings. Even that idea that there's sort of this uh, reinforcing wire that goes around about one third down. That's just like one of the other images we see. This kind of lantern. Oh, Aaron, you're taking me all over the place again. <laughs> There we go. There we go. Um, one more slide and one more. Oh, yeah. This is one of those beautiful... Trying to help chat, people in chat out. Yeah. One of those beautiful um, uh, images where, of course, the, the, uh, the artist is just loving this sort of light. Now, this is a paper lantern. She's just got a candle and she's taken this paper... It's got, um, if we could see the image up close, which unfortunately I didn't zoom way in on it, uh, you can see that it's been pinned together. You can actually see the pin that pins this uh, piece of paper all together. And she is a ballad singer. She's performing at night, probably on the street, uh, just doing street entertainment. And this is what she's using for her lighting device. And we can see even, you know, the... the um, the weave of the cloth and everything else. The, the artist is just amazing on this. And I, I love the lighting device all by itself. It's just great. Ooh, very, I like that one. She's very similar. In fact, it may be the same artist, but this is somebody, um, I think Dawes did the, uh, the engraving cut on this. This is a wooden lantern. You don't see those very often in paintings, um, but of course we have references to them. And this one, I believe, actually has, we can't tell. It could have a candle in there. I think from the look of the back of the lantern that it might have an oil lamp in it. Uh, it's hard to say, but uh, yeah, she's doing oysters there. This has got a couple of different um, lighting devices in it. The boy has a candlestick and he's not holding it very well. <laughs> and then there's a lantern on the floor. Again, oh, just almost like the other ones. Boy. That picture looks just like the ones we yeah, have. Anyway, uh, go ahead, yeah. This one's early, uh, 17th century. And there is a, a lantern all the way up there by the ceiling, one like we've seen many times before. Again, this is early, early, early. 
Um, what's interesting is this lantern design goes, goes way back. And if we kept on going back another 100 years, 150 years, we looked at Bosch or Bruegel paintings, we would find the same lantern showing up again and again. Also, um, the gentleman there that's by the fire, he's lighting his pipe. Look just over his pipe, and that is an oil lamp. I don't know what it's sitting on. It looks like it's going to fall into the fireplace, whatever that is, whatever's going on there. Uh, that is an oil lamp. Uh, right there. So there's multiple lighting devices hanging around here in this kitchen. And are we close to the end? Oh, uh, I think we did that one already. Yeah, try one more to make it. Yep, yep, we're through it. There you go. Whew. Lots and lots of lighting devices, candle, oil. Uh, we didn't have any paintings of rush lights. That's another lighting device that you would have in that time period. Um, it's amazing how how an item like that, again, we don't think about it. We you know, it's like, well, every room has lights, duh, they're in the ceiling or you know, on the sides, and you flip the switch and everything happens. It's n never <laughs> like that in the 18th century, and lighting is is an important part of you know everyday life. And in this case, almost all those paintings, sort of like the light was part of the painting. Uh, so it's they're thinking about it in a whole sort of different way. And candles are um, amazing little devices here. Um, and, you know, we even take our candles for granted. Most of the time we're using, well, let's see, uh, some kind of um, paraffin-based wax, which is very, very inexpensive compared to all these are beeswax candles. They might have used uh, tallow candles, which is like the suet, which melts really, really easily. Um, not only do we take the wax part of the candle for granted, but the wick. The wicks that we have today are specially made. They're, they're um, braided, and they're braided so they're just a little bit tighter on one side than the other. So the candle wick automatically, as it burns, bur tips over and kind of goes down on itself and then automatically sort of takes care of itself. We never have to think about going along and snuffing, which is not putting out a candle, but cleaning up uh, the candle to make it so it doesn't gutter. Uh, we never have to do that, ever. They had to do it all the time. Candles just didn't take care of themselves. Someone had to come along every 10, 15 minutes and fuss with them. So that's, you know, that's taking, you know, uh, for granted our candles. Here's an oil lamp. Can you see it very well? There you go. Uh, an oil lamp, and this is made very, very specially. It's similar, say, like in that one last painting where there was the, it was a ceramic, sort of like a cup with a little uh, spout on one end, and um, it was ceramic so that it can take the heat. This one is made specially. It's based off of an, uh, an example in the um, Winston-Salem, uh, historic Winston-Salem book. It's probably early 19th century, and it's especially made so that the instead of having that little that little uh, spout on one side, it's actually got a little tube, and it's right off the edge. It doesn't actually touch the edge of the pottery here, and that's so that as oil goes up, and then it uh, kind of drips off the end, it goes back into the the uh, little saucer here instead of flowing down the outside of the oil lamp, which is not a very good design. So you definitely want to make one like this. And that's how the nice historic ones are. Our um, Betty lamp, boy, this is black iron, so it's really hard to see. Uh, but this is made exactly the same way, except out of iron. There's a little internal spout where the wick comes up, and that spout is not at the very edge, but just inside the edge so that, again, oil doesn't drip around the outside edge of our oil lamp and just drip on the floor, which they did all the time. They had very, very, sometimes just very primitive uh, cruisy lamps and other uh, sorts of lamps, which were really just sort of like a, just a basin um, with a, a little edge, uh, a little spot where you would put the wick and you just pour oil in there. And it's dirty. You, I don't know if you can see this one. You can see it. Uh, it's like smoke is coming off of it. It's a, it's a very dirty light because it, it's, well, it's just the way oil burns when, when you burn it in this sort of fashion. And maybe if I fussed with it a little bit, 
again, it's one of those you got to fuss with everything. Yeah, if we bring it so that it doesn't have so big, uh, so much wick there. There you go. It's burning nice. Um, but again, it's going to go out after a while. It's going to burn away the wick and I'm going to have to, you know, fuss with it. I'm going to have to keep moving it around. So I'm going to take a break here for a minute. I could talk about this stuff uh, forever and a day. I'm going to let Aaron jump yeah. in. Get some, uh, some yeah. awesome donations. Um, and a lot of them are candle related questions. So if you can see what you're writing. Oh, yes, I can. Writing. I can. The you're moonlight's coming in so I can I can see what I'm doing. Gotcha. OK, first off, I want to welcome N. Namiyama to the <laughs> Nutmeg Tavern members. Thank you so Thank much. You. For those who don't know, that's a um, it's our YouTube membership page. Basically, yeah. it's a way to support us every month. Mm -hmm. um, you get emojis. You get a tag by your name. Shows up in the chat. If you can see people in chat, you can see their names have a tag by them. It's just a way to support us. Just yeah. a fun way to do so. Um, Carol Haycock, thank you. Where did most of the candle molds come from? Max are cool. Thank you. Were there ghost stories told in the 18th century? Or is that more of a 19th century thing? Uh, Still Jane, thank you. Thank you for educating the masses here on this channel. Keep up the awesome content. Thank you. Appreciate that. Mike Crook. Thank you. Any t tips for wax cleanup? All those candles make for some occasional wax drips, I'm sure. Thanks for your how-to videos and tips on making candles. That's a throwback. That is. <laughs> Max are cool again. Thank you. Um, was lighting usually was lighting usually using wax candles and tallow for fuel only? Did they also use reed lights? When did people start using whale oil? Mm -hmm. Nathan Kirk, thank you. Love the apple pie episode this week. Keep up the good work as always. Yeah. Thank you. That was a fun one. Yep, it was. Um, Eurosis Arctos, I guess. Sorry about that. <laughs> I <butchered laughs> that. Um, was whale oil in much use during this time, or was it used in later centuries? Welcome to K Kusmedi. Sorry if I'm butchering that to the Nutmeg Taverns tavern members appreciate that i'm glad he has to read these uh, yeah, names so off ryan can't come back soon enough <laughs> <laughs> uh catherine bradley thank you did they use rush lights in colonial america and if so did they go out of use plain jane thank you loving the episode all is right in the world again now that i've caught the live stream keep it up Yay. aaron how were there her what were historical fire extinguishers like <laughs> That's all I got for now. And uh, yeah, everyone, um, let's let's light the stream. Let's get to a thousand. That's yeah. been like a tradition. A thousand That's right. A we gotta we got we have to do it. I'm gonna let me move Here's it. one more. Yeah. Just, just to get it. Speed and style Tony. Yeah. Did they actually burn candles at both ends for more light, or was that just a say? <laughs> uh uh both ends. Okay. Uh that's funny. Um so where did uh, candle molds from, uh, come from? I, actually, if we went back to that one Diderot's, encyclo uh, Diderot's image uh, where the tinsmith was working and he had the, the oil lamp in the, on the ceiling, you could, I believe you can see um, other sorts of lamps and candle molds in that same sort of image. So uh, yeah, that's it. candle molds are being made usually out of tin. Sometimes you'll even have cast pewter molds made out, made for uh, casting candles. Um, ghost stories. So there's a question about did they tell ghost stories in the 18th century? And I actually, I was thinking about this because of Monday's video, which I don't want to give Monday's video. Can no, I video? Spoil it. Yeah, so I'm not going to spoil Monday's video. Uh, um, also, before I forget, uh, watch for a special, special, special. Halloween based live stream next week yeah, on maybe Wednesday, maybe? Wednesday, as of right now. We're planning on a special Wednesday. Um, so be ready for that. Uh, ghost stories. So, what's happening here is that there's uh, the 18th century is, and one of the reasons why we study the 18th century is because certain things are happening in the 18th century that are very, very sort of groundbreaking. And or or it's the roots of groundbreaking, right? So, 18th century is the classical age of enlightenment when there's this great change in ideas around scientific thought and empirical thinking and all this good stuff. And these ideas of 
ghost stories and superstition is kind of being kind of driven out and suppressed, at, at least from the top down by, you know, thinkers and colleges and all that good stuff. So I think that um, you see that somewhat suppressed maybe in published works, but I think still in day-to-day -day life that is um, happening. Right, it's, it's certainly not being it's like disappearing, and you almost see that sort of a resurgence um, of this romantic thought and these kinds of stories happening in the 19th century, and even toward the end of the 18th century, this idea of the Gothic novel or Gothic sort of stories start to show up in that late 18th century, early 19th century, and it's probably a reaction to all that enlightenment thinking. So there's things happening, you know, societal-wise, philosophy-wise, that maybe we're not paying attention to all that much. So ghost stories, yeah, and, and especially I think some of those things come through from the 17th century and they bleed on through. And again, that's something I'll probably talk about next week. Um, wax cleanup. Yeah, so uh, obviously for uh, like us today, things like um, ice cubes <laughs> work well on fabric where you can get it really cold and then you can flake the wax off. Other people probably have special uh, fixes for cleaning up wax. You know, you put these guys in the in the oven and sort of, you know, very low temperature and melt it all and pour it off. But that's kind of dangerous because you get all this molten wax in your oven. So you want to put that on. Uh, don't ask me for advice on wax cleanup. That's all there is to it. Just shh, don't do it. Um, lighting, read lights. Someone else mentioned rush lights. So rush lights are a thing in Great Britain in the 18th century. Uh, and that's sort of a lamp that has a sort of this like this weighted pair of pliers that holds a reed, usually a three-sided reed that you uh, peel the the edges off of so it becomes a little bit more absorbent. You dip those in oil and then you, you know, put them and they, I don't have an example of, we used to sell them, but I don't have one anymore that I can get my hands on right this second. But anyway, uh, it's, talk about, I mean, if a, this kind of oil lamp is inefficient and smoky and terrible, rush lamps or reed lamps are horrible, just terrible. They don't last for very long. And um, I've never seen it work out well. And I don't think they ever really caught on in North America to any great extent. Um, whale oil, usually whale oil lamps, the design of the lamp itself or the burning burner mechanisms, very different from just standard oils. And you can kind of tell the design and those typically show up in the early 19th century and in the mid 19th century, much more common. So I don't think you were seeing whale oil per se all that much in the 18th century. I could be wrong on that one. Fire extinguisher. If you got a bucket of water or a bucket of sand, that's your fire extinguisher. And burning the candle at both ends, that's just the saying because you can't do it. <laughs> it doesn't work at all. It's terrible. <laughs> I mean, you turn the candle sideways and then the wax drips out. And well, No, it's just a saying because it's something you can't do. There we go. Uh, before we go any further, I wanted to grab the Patreon names. I missed them last week because sometimes I forget. And we were shooting the video last week. Yeah, that's right. Oh, we shot a oh, video today. But I remembered it today. So... Uh, Patreon people, I got to fold in two weeks. I'll read them fast, but that doesn't mean I don't appreciate you guys. Uh, Patreon, Crossfade. Um, I like that name. Kyle Wayne 3. Claude Brown. Carrie Greenwalt. Charles Rose. Wingate. Uh, my writing is bad. Um, Bowaclaw. I know. I've, I know. I knew it. It sounded right when I wrote it down and now it looks wrong. Uh, Shannon Segovia, Paul Wright, D.M. Rotach, Rotok, or maybe that's the way it's supposed to be there. Um, Elrude the Ninth, Vanessa Wilkinson, Opus, Jano Rockford, uh, Catherine Leach, Linda Walsh, Scott Void, Abby Berg. Uh, wow, you guys are all 
brand new uh, folks that support us on Patreon. A big thank you to you new people and all you from the past. Did you say something, Aaron? I said thank you. Oh, yes, and thank you. Yes, it is amazing how you guys help us out. Uh, So, again, thank you. Patreon is one of those places where you can just sign up to help us out a little bit of a little bit per month. And there's a link in the description section. Have any questions for me before I run on to more stuff? So one that keeps popping up is uh, carbon monoxide. Yeah. At the time, was that a thing with, you know, no ventilation and you're just constantly burning candles? Kind of like how this room is right now. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I don't. I don't think I've ever seen very many references to it, and most likely because we're used to sort of very weather tight houses. Uh, they had very unweather tight houses, so I'm not sure that they had all that much problem with carbon monoxide because of the ways like open fireplaces. They pull more air out of your house than heat they put in. And, you know, it's pulling it through. Well, there's nothing, there's no wind, there's no weather seals on your windows or doors or your walls or anything. You're like living in a sieve. So, um, no, I don't think they had any problem with it. I have more donations. I guess we can do that. Yeah. Let's see, where did I leave off? Okay, here we go. Denise Maloney uh, Pirin, oh, thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Love the candlelit live stream. It's a little spooky in here. Yeah, just a little bit. Uh, Blake Morris, thank you. You've spoken before on regulations surrounding the quality of bread, but were there any regulations at the time for how candles were made slash used mm. to prevent big city destroying fires? That's <laughs> a cool question. Right. Um, Nolani, no... Naminyama, <laughs> I think. Seasonal mugs, question mark. The deer one. We'll see about that. Yes. Yes. Go um, ahead. David Danelli, thank you. Great subject. I love my candle mold from you guys. I think this weekend I'll be making uh, candles. Excellent. Right on. Um, LVVA, thank you. Says thanks for the videos. And then Wendy Carr says thank you for making us all smile. Yeah. Thank you so I'm much. glad you're enjoying the live stream. I'm yes. oh, I always have fun. And regulations about candles, hmm, good question, and quite likely, but I don't know of any off the top of my head. They certainly did have regulations, though, about things like fire in different places. You can't build houses of wood. You have to build them a brick, London fire, all that good stuff, right? That's true. Um, And then there were things like fire insurance and and fire engines and that's some of that is in uh, Benjamin Franklin's work and his autobiography so yeah there's uh, they're they're concerned about fire and what to do about that and the question about mugs nutmeg tavern mugs the ones with the the stag Um, yes stay tuned (laughs) things are coming soon um, and this time we're going to try our best to make sure they don't run out right away. We, <laughs> really, we're trying hard. We're making those mug people work double time. I still think, I still think that mug of the mug of the month club. <laughs> mug of the month club. One a month. Sign up, so no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> let me go back and try to touch on all these sort of uh, lighting is one of those. Again, it's got all these great little things that you don't know about it, little tricks like the, you know, the wick is special today and that's a 19th century thing. It wasn't true in the 18th century. So I uh, alluded to the, the glass in that, one, in that one candle lantern, right? So this is not glass, um, but I, this is a sheet of transparent horn. And this candle lantern here actually has a horn, horn glass in it. So what happens, uh, why would you have a lantern that used something like this instead of glass? Number one, glass is expensive in this time frame. Um, And horn is, well, you can see that, right? Horn is, it's flexible. It, you don't, it doesn't break. If you dropped your lantern, the, the horn wouldn't break at all. And if you put it up against the flame, if you put glass up there, uh, it, would, it would break because you'll get a thermal differential. So the glass will expand where it's hot. It won't expand everywhere else. And then it breaks. And uh, then you've got broken glass, which isn't very helpful. So in a lantern, glass isn't the best thing. And so 
what will happen with this horn is if I left it over the flame for a long time, yes, yeah, soot would gather and it would start to actually burn this. And this uh, horn is, is actually sort of condensed hair is what it is. And so it'll start to smell like burning hair, but it won't catch on fire and it, um, it will you know, res resist damage. So uh, horn is what's showing up in a lot of these lanterns. It's also flexible so we can put it in that round lantern if we really want to. We can, you know, put the pieces in there. And it's made from cow horn that, you know, there's uh, like white horn or transparent horn that we cut the horn open, it sort of delaminates a little bit, we boil in oil or we get it hot in some other method, and then we can start to uh, flex it and turn it into different things. We can flatten it out into sheets. We can turn it into horn combs. We can make horn panes like this. And of course you've heard of, well, the name lantern means the horn is actually in the word, right? So, uh, and something like a horn book. You might've heard of a horn book, which has a sheet of horn uh, to protect the letters underneath. So it's a little learning device that would have the ABCs or some other learning thing. And then it would have this little sheet of glass, sheet of horn, over the top of it so it doesn't get messed up. You might even be able to write on it and then rub it off. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, that this, this horn materials is amazing stuff. Uh, we do actually offer sheets just big enough to use in our lanterns. So that's our barn lantern there. This is a, this is a normal one with uh, standard clear glass in it. Uh, we don't offer it with the horn already in it. Um, there's the uh, tin lanterns, which most of the lanterns there you saw were metal. Some of them were like this uh, with punched tin in them. Let me put a candle in there. There's one right back there. Uh, very, very, very popular. And one of the reasons why these guys are popular, again, they're very light, very inexpensive, um, and there's no glass to break. They don't put out a whole lot of light unless you open up the door but they're very decorative, even with the door closed. Uh, you generally would keep these with the door open if you wanted to get any light out. Um, and also the candle will burn a little too rapidly if you have the uh, door closed, at least unless it's colder weather. So uh, most of the time you had the door open, you'd only close it when you were walking or you know you were worried about wind blowing it out or something like that. Whoops, 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 whoops. Now, they did, yes? Well, no, I thought you were done. Keep no, going. no, I, I can talk for hours. Um, glass fronted, uh, again, similar design. Now, remember the the crime uh, picture where the, the guy was, you know, there was sword fighting. Well, there is your, you can't see it very well because it's a very, this is an old piece, um, but it's a dark lantern. This one was made, I believe it's got, yes, it's got an oil lamp on the inside. It's a little reflector so that it uh, reflects the light forward. This one has a magnifying lens in it, which is typical of 19th century pieces. Uh, if you go 18th century, a lot of times this might just have plain glass in it. And there's the dark slide in it, so you can see that. That way you can cover it up. You're the night watchman, you want to sneak up on somebody, or maybe you're robbing someone and you want to sneak up on it. Uh, and then you can open it up, scare everybody, with your super bright candle, or in this case, uh, oil lamp. This one is probably mid 19th century, but very, very similar to all the 18th century illustrations. I mean, right down to the handle in the back and you know, the, the way this, I, just, I love that. Exactly that the same. Awesome. Yes. So um, that is that style of lantern, very hard to get to, to make that. Here is a standard four-sided uh, lantern. This is a frontier lantern. So the very first thing, the very first thing that, that uh, when my father started the company in 1973, he started it with lanterns. And one of the first things that we offered that we made was a wooden candle lantern. And this is the actual, exactly the same design. And uh, for years and years, they were made either by my grandfather or my, my father, and they would be signed on the bottom. Those don't exist anymore, or no, not new ones. Um, and for a while, the company name was even Frontier Lanterns until it was changed to James Townsend Son and then 
than to Townsend. So lanterns, that's something we've been studying for a long, long time. Uh, let's see. And that's uh, what some people are asking about. Yeah. The, like, oh, what's like the logo and stuff? Mm -hmm. Is a lantern mm -hmm. coming right. comes from all that? Yeah, the lantern was in the in the logo of the business from like the beginning. <laughs> For a while, the sign looked a little different, but then we changed the sign design um, at some point. I don't even remember where the you know the time how how like it was probably in the mid '80s when the sign design changed. But there was a lantern on it even before that. Yep. Um, let me see what I got here. Um, sorry, I've been trying to. I'll I'll keep talking while he is looking. So, here's another uh, great kind of fun item. You know, it's like you think about. You know, you, today we might pop a little flashlight in our pocket. Uh, this is your your pocket. Uh, Candle lantern, you know, how am I, what am I going to do? Uh, a little tin box has a little uh, candle holder that folds in there. We can put the candle in there and then uh, shut it all up. Boy, it just barely fits. There you go. Pop it right in your pocket. Have light wherever you need to go. You could probably definitely fit your flint and steel in there so that you can strike your own light. Maybe, you know, if it's dark 10 or 15 minutes later, you'd have a candle going. <laughs> it's just that easy. Yep. And we also have, uh, this isn't an item that we currently offer, but we have, unfortunately, I, most of the pieces in our collection are kind of packed away right now because we've moved them recently. Um, but this is um, a, a reproduction of a Betty lamp. So again, one of those where this is, Many times there would be a double version of this where you'd have exactly the same sort of pan that fit on the inside of this. So again, as the oil ran up the end here and dripped off the edge, it would be caught by the pan underneath it. Oh. But really typical hanging oil lamp. Here's something. Yes. This, I, I, someone asked about this earlier and I for, forgot about it. But um, match solutions, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, wood with molten s sulfur. Mm -hmm. Hardened. Um, what about that? The idea of, of uh, obviously they didn't have strike on box matches. But. Yeah, exactly. So hold on a second. This is getting a little crazy there. <laughs> um, the um, there were uh, lucifers or wooden matches, spiles, and some other tools to move light around in that 18th century time period. Again, matches per se. Not really. I mean, those I think are like 1830s, 1840s, if I believe properly. I'm not sure about exactly how those sulfur matches worked or if they worked to any great extent. But they also would just use a, sometimes what's termed a match in the 18th century is just a very, very thin wooden stick that you would move flame from one spot to the other. So it didn't have anything on the end at all. You would just light it on, you know, in your fire, in your fireplace or on another candle. And then you could go around and uh, light things up. So sometimes a match in that time period is just a stick. That's all it is. <laughs> um, someone was wondering about the idea of, hold on, let me see if I can go find it again. Like uh, uh, alternative for candles like like on the frontier mm -hmm. like if you didn't have you know the, the things you needed what would be a right well uh if you don't have candles which is i mean that's going to happen um a lot candles are expensive so again you're going to use them as little as possible can you know candle light or you know artificial light because well you know you're just going to go to sleep when it gets dark but Obviously, there are times when you're going to want to light up your your uh, location. A lot of times, they're in the house. They're just dealing with whatever light comes out of the fireplace, and you get used to being in the dark. Um, we're not used to that, but I've been in other places in the world where people just walked in the dark all the time, and it didn't seem to bother them whatsoever. And it's something that we—it's like, how can you? I mean, these were people 
like going up and down a mountain without any sort of external light at all and there was hardly any moonlight and, and I was astounded didn't didn't even phase them you know so um, they probably may do it a lot less than we would consider you you know doable at whatsoever but if they do want to they're going to use some sort of an oil lamp so they're not going to use like lamp oil or whale oil or anything like that they're going to use animal fat um you know bacon grease whatever that is left over in the house to light their their house now it might be smelly yes uh it might fill the place with smoke but they're used to smoke anyway coming out of their fireplace i can guarantee you they're used to smoke it doesn't again doesn't phase them a bit um but they're going to use leftover cooking grease um someone was asking about if rush lights were still prominent yeah i talked about rush or reed lamps earlier and again i believe that's more of an english thing and that by the time that is coming over to north america just not very popular um and i'm not sure whether our reeds weren't as good or whether we just had other i just don't i don't know but that is what i believe is true uh, even though there are 18th century examples of rush lamps, you just don't see that many of them. When did they use reeds soaked in grease? Again, that's the the same yeah. the, that same idea, and this uh, these soaking the reed uh, parts. Uh, it's probably a 17th century thing, mm. and that's again a little bit out of the time our time period, um, and. I don't have a lot of great references to it. So it's one of those things that it's like, I know about them. Question is, do they really fit into our time period in our place? Mm. Super good question. Yeah. Let's see what else we got. Um, a couple donations just to catch up. Um, Takela says, you said it right the first time. I don't, I don't know what they mean, but thank you for the donation. And then Matthew H., thank you. Any plans for an outhouse on the homestead? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm wondering about outhouses and uh, homesteads in the time period and whether or not they actually use them. Oh, you think that's not even a thing? I think they just went out. Uh-huh. Uh, let's hope they went out. I mean, no if you house. look at the Dutch paintings <laughs> from the 17th century, it doesn't even look like they went out. Oh, uh, It's my. just like... that. <laughs> Any whatever, right? Yeah. So it's like interesting um, paintings. Um, so yeah, I, I don't. Um, are we going to do one? Uh, we should. We, yes. There. Yes. As long that, as that was the as answer. Long as nobody uses it. <laughs> as exactly. long as no one's uses it. Yeah, just just for fun. We can't be doing that. Come on, now. <laughs> boy. He's just. He's not really. Some people are not willing to get into the 18th century spirit. Uh, not not in this way. <laughs> I like I like the candlelit room. I'll go I'll go with that. Um, let's see what else do we got. Um, I saw something a second ago, and then it, a lot of comments it slipped away. Oh, here this this might be kind of interesting. Um, did the Native Americans use candles often? I don't think they ever used candles. Never. And I think they were very much the kind of people that said. Why, why do we need all this artificial light? If the campfire does fine, yeah. and if you can't live with that, then, you know, I don't know. There was a, that, when you, when you read about how the Native Americans are reacting to what, um, you know, the settlers, their lifestyle, um, their schooling, they were very much, you know, well, we've adapted ourselves to this this lifestyle. And there's no reason that we would need to have these other things right. like candles or whatnot. They, of course, they did say, yes, you know, we want those brass and copper cooking pots. Yes, we want uh, steel knives and tomahawks. But for the most part, the rest of their living arrangement, they were plenty happy with and really didn't have any any need for uh, other things right mm, do, 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 do. where do people get their oil from 
merchants in the nearest town. Bolt so carrying. most of the oil is just straight up animal based. I mean, sometimes you they'll they'll talk about sweet oil, which is olive oil, in the time period. So that's being imported. Obviously, you're not growing any olives here, uh, but you're gonna not. You're definitely gonna relegate that to something like um, cooking and eating, using it as a salad oil. So the oil that you're using here is just waste animal fat oil. So. You're going to be using muscle fats, um, again, bacon, grease, and uh, the other oils that come off of, you know, excess oils from cooking. Um, not very many plant-based oils really are, are showing up to any great extent. So today we have all this like soybean oil or corn oil or all that, but that is extracted in very, very modern methods. They didn't have anything like that at all and sometimes you'll see references to coal oil so oil just basically seeping up out of the ground and they would you know it would might come up onto a pool of water and they would absorb that and and um, you know take it off you don't hear about it being used much though yeah. um a couple donations and we can probably start wrapping it up um midwest minutemen thank you thank says you. uh I think we need to have a Nutmeg Tavern fan convention. Mm. Captivity 91. Thank you. Was kerosene used in lanterns that early in the early 18th century? Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the donations. A convention? Well, we'll see what happens with the whole world, yeah, won't yeah. we? Yeah, we've definitely. We could do we, it the virtual convention. There we yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've talked about it a little bit, you know, after the, you yeah. know, the pandemic yeah, and stuff. Yeah, big meetup or something. something happened, yeah. Right. Um, definitely on the in our mind space and what was that second one uh, kerosene I, I oh yeah kerosene yeah. so kerosene uh, is definitely a petroleum based thing and again 18th century that's 1700s oil is a 19th century thing especially petroleum oil is what I meant to say uh, petroleum oil stuff and kerosene that's all like you know mid 19th century and later uh, again if you want early 19th century the the replacement there is whale oil and then of course less expensive um maybe not better but less expensive uh kerosene shows up and that's uh what people are going to be moving through and they keep you know moving to that next technology so it's like oh we're you know burning animal fats now we're burning whale oil again animal fats now we're burning kerosene now we're burning gas you know coal gas or whatever where they would you like cook coal and then, you know, off gases, burning natural gases. So we have these, all this different stepping stones to technology um, and they keep replacing each other. Just like today, you know, incandescent lamps and then new kind of light bulbs and then new kind of light bulbs. Who knows what we'll be lighting our world with next, like uh, shocking um, uh, fireflies or something. Who knows? Who knows what? Okay. So two things before we head out. We are about 50 likes away from 1,000 likes. Let's make it happen. Yeah. Let's end the week on a high note. And uh, then I have one more donation. John Talley does the, thank you. Does the fireplace light up the whole cabin when it's dark outside or would you need more lighting if you were reading? The fire we had today, <laughs> yes. It lit the whole thing. I had poor John sitting next to the fireplace reading. I almost excerpt. caught on yeah. fire. It was so hot. I was probably five feet away from the fire and I could feel it. So it depends on how big the fire is. Yeah, if you depends on what you were doing, but yeah, you would get used to reading from uh, something like that. It, it's not it's not that difficult right. until you get old like me and then you can't <laughs> read in uh, dim light anymore. So uh, remember again, thanks Patreon people. people. Uh, make sure to watch that Patreon feed in the next hour or two, and I'll try to get that special thing posted. Um, watch, all you folks, watch next week. Let's say watch out for a Wednesday. We'll try to you know, give you a community post, a heads up, post it early. Uh, a special live stream, very different, very, very different, and, and it sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. So watch out for that one, and we'll do our standard uh, Friday one. Monday's cooking episode should be great. Yep. 
You'll Should see be. that huge fire I was talking yeah, about. Yeah, so that ought to be a fun one. So lots of stuff in the pipeline. Uh, we're always just doing wild and crazy stuff. One more donation. Yes. CDK says, ha, thought you were done. See, they found a trick on me. <laughs> you know, maybe next time I won't read it. Good. Good to hear. <laughs> Thank you Thank for you. doing that to Aaron for me because what? he couldn't even, he didn't even turn what? the camera on himself. So. What? You know, yeah, I have to I have to do the whole thing right <laughs> here, but I love it. It's been a great time in the Nutmeg Tavern by the candlelight, and uh, it's it's uh, we always have fun coming into the the tavern, calming down a little bit. You know, the rest of the world, psh, forget it. Let's just sit down, have a nice drink, and uh, enjoy history and just the little things sometimes you know this little things bring it to life candlelight is one of those things thank you for coming along today with us as we enjoy the nutmeg tavern i hope you have a tremendous weekend again i want to thank you for all your amazing support if you just watch our videos commenting liking them right or whether you support us with patreon super chat uh, merch, whatever, buying mugs, all those things, they make it possible for us to continue making videos. I wouldn't make them unless you were there watching them. So again, thank you for all you do and have a great weekend.